2016 has come and gone, and I've got some thoughts on how the various platform holders fared, and what games from this year's E3 have caught my interest. To avoid copyright flags for gameplay footage and using trailers on this one, because this is part of the reason why I stopped doing trailers last year, doing these discussions last year somewhat, I'm doing this vlog style. First off, let's talk about the platform holders. Microsoft has surprisingly good showing at this year's E3, with the Xbox One S showcasing a really good price point for a smaller console that can be oriented vertically, that will, should make it work nicely in my entertainment center, and the entertainment centers and setups for other people with smaller apartments and that sort of thing, while also supporting 4K Blu-ray, so you can start adding those DVD, those Blu-rays to your library when you have the opportunity to get a 4K TV. That said, the, the messaging around Project Scorpio was not quite as good. Over the course of Microsoft's press conference, I went from being sold on the Xbox One S to being more inclined to wait until I got more information on Scorpio. After listening to Giant Bomb's podcast for Night 2 of E3, I got a better understanding of Scorpio, and that's a system meant basically almost exclusively for 4K TVs, which are well above my price point this time, with a like 24, 26 inch TV, like what I have, running around a thousand dollars, over a thousand dollars, like one thousand five hundred, which is kind of nuts, and certainly well above the price point of anyone else, as you're like anyone watching the show. It's, I could be wrong. You could be a venture capitalist or something like that. So, consequently, I'm more inclined to get an Xbox One S eventually, probably either closer to this holiday season particularly the ever-expanding list of backwards-compatible games, which will hopefully include most of the Xbox 360 games in my library. For example, Mass Effect 3, which I'm currently in the middle of playing for a Let's Play. And by the time this goes out, we should be wrapping up the um, Lost Planet 3 episodes going up, and the following week will be Mass Effect 3 Let's Play. Anyway, Nintendo, speaking of things which aren't which somewhat get coverage on my channel in terms of older stuff, and, but not the new stuff because of copyright claims. Nintendo had only a breath, only a handful of games they were featuring, but the main title they featured, Legend of Zelda: Breath of the Wild, looks absolutely amazing. The game uses a sense of strong visual style and good visual aesthetics through the world design and character design and that sort of thing to create a game which looks great on the Wii U hardware and will hopefully scale well when the NX comes out. It's sort of like they've learned the lessons from, for example, with um, the cel-shaded Zelda game, and also, for that matter, from what Valve has done with Team Fortress 2 and how cel-shaded graphics has kept the game looking really good over progressive console generations and helps the graphics scale very well. Well, not console generations, but hardware generations, while the graphics are still able to scale very well for multiple different setups and picking a visual aesthetic, a more watercolored aesthetic, but still a, a distinct visual aesthetic in a stylistic form, as opposed to going, full, not quite full realism, but on a more realistic art style. To make something that will look, uh, looks good on the Wii U, and will no doubt look, spec look very good as well on the NX. The game's music also sounds great, with a vibe from the musical stylings that reminds me a lot of Joe Hisaishi's work with Hayao Miyazaki's films. I doubt they got, I can keep mangling his name, Hisaishi himself to do the music, but if they did, that's pretty awesome. It's definitely a, a coup for Nintendo. Next we have Sony showing. They put a lot of focus on Sony VR, and in particular they did something which I haven't seen that many other people do in terms of their VR projects. This could be, be Valve with HTC, with um, Oculus, or what have you. They announced what like, we consider a definitive killer app with Resident Evil 7. Going from the conference, the game can be played entirely in VR, and by shifting to a first-person perspective through VR, they're creating a game that will be more immersive than earlier titles in the series, while still maintaining a sense of horror and suspense through both limiting your resources that are available as with the standard sort of survival horror style, but also managing information. You're now limited to a much more first-person perspective 
with a partially lit area in the center of the frame, where eyes would be, and with progressing areas of darkness around the edges, which basically means that you're having a much tighter view of what you can and can't see, and allowing you to build a stronger sense of suspense because you're now limited by audio cues and other things for what's behind you and off to the sides, and should hopefully build a stronger sense of suspense and fear. Moving into third-party titles, and non-console exclusive titles. Call of Duty Infinite Warfare really turned things around for me. I'd seen the original trailer and was kind of on the fence, and not really interested, particularly after how, well, Advanced Warfare was kind of really iffy for what its narrative, where its narrative went, to now that I've seen where the game goes, and how, from seeing how the game may appear to be working out narratively, to being something that really catches my interest. It looks like there'll be some options to choose how you fight the war in terms of selecting missions in a somewhat nonlinear fashion. I'm not it's not clear quite whether it's going to be something sort of super robot wars e where you're selecting missions down a particular path where you get a particular sort of mission string where okay, we're going to say sweep through the asteroid belt and take the sort of long jump out through nowhere to hit the enemy from behind and risk North and other places being attacked, or we will kind of try to push them back along the brunt of their advancement, and that sort of, uh, their route of advance towards Earth, and be a much riskier flight, much more difficult fight, but Earth will fare better, that sort of thing. It'd be interesting how this play, how this pans out, and how your actions, and how the choices you make affect the war effort, if this happens at all. It is entirely possible it's just, you do a bunch of side missions, and there are only real key story missions, and you don't have much control of how the story plays out. I like the idea of Call of Duty um, Infinite Warfare giving the player some narrative agency in terms of strategy planning, and how the war, and how the game's story, and how it depicts the war will pan out. In some form or another. Sega showed off Yakuza 0 which looked like an interesting title. Now, the Telephone Club minigame looked a little rough in terms of content. It's something where some of the imagery, particularly when you're on the call and Kiryu is trying to figure out what the person on the other end looks like, it's something definitely where I wouldn't want someone walking into the room while I'm playing the game because they draw the wrong impression. Um... But that said, it's an optional minigame, and one of the things I've liked about the Yakuza games is if you want to skip these minigames, you absolutely can with no narrative or mechanical penalty of any kind. You aren't weaker from a gameplay standpoint by not doing telephone club missions, hopefully in this game, or in previous games, not doing hostess club stuff or host club stuff over the course of the game. You may get benefits from sub-quest chains, which is the one in the first game where you learn how to use sword and sword style weapons better, but those are more specific side quests as opposed to minigame series. Now, because this game is a prequel to the first title, hopefully this game will do some interesting stuff to lead into the first game. Particularly since the first title set up that that game's antagonist, Akira Nishiki, was a friend of Cosmic Kiryu's going back to their common orphanage days, and that Kiryu's love interest, Yumi, was also at that orphanage. And I hope we do something with that, with those characters and setting things up for that game, particularly since we're getting, since Japan has been getting a remastered version of the original Yakuza, and hopefully we'll get that version in the U.S. as well. The game also the second plot line in featuring Kiryu's de facto rival, Goro Majima, set in a different city, I believe more towards um, Osaka, which could also be interesting. I'm kind of interested in Majima, but I enjoy him mer more as an antagonist figure instead of being a full-fledged protagonist with equal weight to Kiryu. Horizon Zero Dawn continues to look really interesting, but that's a game I'm really already interested in getting, and I knew it was coming to the U.S., where Yakuza Zero hadn't gotten a U.S. release date at the time. Aside from the other games which I was kind of on the fence on or hadn't heard about, I'm cautiously optimistic about Detroit being human or becoming human. David Cage's stories remind me of a gymnast doing an overambitious dismount or a figure skater doing an overambitious trick. They have concepts that are appealing and are almost executed beautifully, and if they landed, they'd be stunning. 
but they but then they missed the landing and fall flat on flat on your on their face and you just gotta flinch. And that's that's been the case from what I understand with Fahrenheit, with um Heavy Rain, and with Beyond Two Souls. I hoping I'm really hoping that Cage manages to stick the landing this time. If he fails, I won't be disappointed nor surprised. But I'm rooting for him to stick the landing to nail that trick anyway. Other than those, Watch Dogs 2 looks interesting, and it looks like it'll be a little less dour than the original trilogy. Or block of games. Well, not really trilogy. I, well, the first game. I'm jumping ahead of myself and thinking of God of War. With Watch Dogs 2, the depiction of hacking culture feels off, but it feels off in the same way that hacking culture depicted in Hackers felt off. Or even to a certain degree, hacking and conspiracy theory culture in, or at least hacking culture in the X-Files with the lone gunman feel off. Dumb and cheesy, but in a way that hopefully, over the course of the game, will grow on me and feel appealing, as opposed to just making me roll my eyes. Getting back to trilogies and blocks of games and what I accidentally stumbled into earlier, the introduction of the new God of War game did something I never expected a God of War game to do, which is make me interested in a God of War game. I played the first game, or tried to, and the original God of War basically ran into problems, both the first game and that series, with Kratos effectively being a one-note character, where that one note was played to the point of tedium in ways that quickly, and at least for me, went in very distasteful directions. It didn't help that the character of Kratos was written in ways that felt like the character was effectively bracing, embracing a bunch of the excesses from comic book characters from the late 90s, in terms of content designed specifically to be edgy and shocking without thinking of, about the hows and whys of that aspect of the character and why they're engaging in those actions. Yeah, Kratos was tricked into killing his wife and child by Ares, and that's why he's mad. And that's why he's doing all these things. But it's still just a one-note thing. We never really spend much time with his wife and family before they die. It's just, by the time the first game happens, they're already dead. We don't flash back to that point. It's, we don't get those moments, which really hurt the story. We get those later in, in the PSP games, but even then, they're focused more on just repeating the action and doing the same series of action beats in some form or another, as opposed to the, well... As opposed to giving us something where we care about the family and focusing on the focusing on Kratos' family and why he cares about them. Finally, to give a quick rundown of the titles I was interested in before E3 and I'm still interested in that are coming out. In addition to Horizon Zero Dawn, which I've already talked about briefly, Episode 5, The New King of Fighters, Shin Megami Tensei Apocalypse, Dragon Quest Builders. All those I'm still definitely hyped for. Um, and looking forward to seeing more about it and hopefully picking up in the future. Particular Persona 5 and Dragon Quest Builders have definitely caught my interest. Dragon Quest Builders, by adding some structure to the sort of the Minecraft gameplay style, will hopefully make a game that, for me, because I've never gotten into Minecraft before, it's, I've wanted something with a little more narrative direction, or even just narrative, and hopefully Dragon Quest Builders will do that. We'll see. So... What did you all think of E3? Are there any titles that surprised you coming out of the show that I didn't mention? Were there anything games that you were hyped about that you're looking for in the future that I didn't talk about and perhaps I should check out and keep an eye out for and as we approach those games' release dates? Um, the Last Guardian also certainly looks absolutely interesting, and I'm looking to see how that turns out. If you have any thoughts on those things and games you should think I should check out or keep an eye out for from E3, please let me know in the comments. So next time we are back on schedule with a look at Record of Lotus War. Once again, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, 
Please like and subscribe to this channel. Subscribe and get you notified when future episodes come out. And liking lets me know that you enjoyed the episode. The video on the right will be of the previous episode of Nintendo Power Retrospectives, if you want to go see what I reviewed previously that on that show. And the video on the left will take you to the previous episode of Breaking It All Down, while well, you'll get to see what I covered there. And below that will be a link to my Patreon page if you wish to back the show. Backing the show can get you a mention in the credits, and also, depending on your level of support, you can determine what I do future Let's Plays of on Breaking It All Down and what else I review on that show as well. So go ahead and click on that and back the show. Also, backing the show helps me get the show out more often and improve the production quality of the show, which is good for everyone. Once again, thank you very much for watching, and see you next time.